going to speak this morning on the theme Christ in the creation. But first, let me I mention uh, just an announcement or so. The several people have asked me about these books that we have. There's uh, a copy back on the uh, table in the back room of each of the books that we distribute there at our creation center. Some by me and some by others. Also, we have a number of uh, tapes that we distribute and film strips and so forth. Uh, on the first day, I had a number of our book lists. We we have all these described and listed with an order blank and so on, but they they were all gone. So I'll send a copy of these to uh, of this list to each of you who put your name on that uh, list back there. Also, a, a little brochure describing our textbook writing program and our research program and so forth out there. And if I can find one or two other things to, to send along, I'll do that and keep in touch with you. Uh, this, uh, these books that I do have here, I kept one each, I think a couple of them from uh, one, of the, one of the titles, from meetings in Denver just before coming here in order to bring them and, and uh, have one copy available. And if anybody wants to buy this, uh, these few copies that I have here, I'd be glad to sell those. Or this morning before I leave. I have to leave here at, uh, right after lunch. So uh, if you want to do that, otherwise you can order them later if, you, if you'd like. And I think maybe there's some in the bookstore, too. And perhaps Brother Wilson can order others if you need to. Well, it's certainly been good to be with you these few days. I wish we could stay for the end of the seminar. It's been a blessing to me to hear these other men of God bring the word. And I would appreciate your prayers been really wonderful to get to know you folks in this church and this college. The Lord has his hand on you here, and we'll certainly be remembering you. First chapter of Romans. Very familiar passage, and it has some real meat in it for our study this morning, I believe. Beginning in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now in verse 28 it says, They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Therefore God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And this, of course, describes the drift of early man down into paganism, into pantheism, from the original knowledge of God which he had from the, from the beginning of time, and especially from the time after the flood when God started over again with Noah and his family. I think this describes specifically what happened after the people were scattered at the Tower of Babel, and they drifted off into tribes and nations and developed their own systems, retaining a certain amount of, of tradition from the primeval revelation, but rejecting the knowledge of the true God, which they had in the beginning, they rather decided to make God in their own image, to, to erect a model of God to their own specifications. And so they, they began to build images of wood and stone, and they made God look like a man or like a bird or like a beast or a creeping thing. And they drifted then down into this paganism, this really pantheism, nature worship, worship of the stars and the hosts of heaven, and so on. Well, now all of this was nothing but a, an early form of evolutionism. I don't know whether you thought of it that way or not, but... Basically, that's true, when one worships the creation rather than the creator, something which has been created rather than the one who created it, basically he's identifying ultimate reality with, with the universe, with the cosmos, and he makes that his God. And this is nothing but evolution, trying to explain ultimate reality 
in terms of, of things. And nowadays, of course, man is a little more sophisticated than to build a model of God with his hands and set it on a stick somewhere. But he builds a model of God with his own imaginings, and he erects some kind of philosophical model of ultimate truth, which to him is his God. Evolutionary pantheism, evolutionary humanism, is just a more sophisticated form of evolutionary paganism. And do you know that every, as you go back into Greek philosophy or Babylonian mythology or Egyptian cosmology, all of these are evolutionary systems. All of them begin with eternal matter in some form or other. And then the gods or the forces of nature or whatever begin to operate on this primeval material and organize it up into its present form. This is nothing but evolution. Some people say, you know, that the that Moses, who wrote Genesis presumably, uh, was just accommodating the primitive mentality of the early Hebrew people when he wrote in terms of creation. They weren't sophisticated enough to understand evolution and the great age of the earth and so forth, and so he wrote in those terms in order to get across these spiritual ideas to them. Well, this is ridiculous because those people were accustomed to think only in terms of evolution and the great age of the earth. That's what all the other people of that day thought. The, the idea that the earth was infinitely old, great millions of years and so on, this was nothing new. This was back uh, held by all the early pagans. And they all thought in terms of evolution so that in order to get across the idea of special creation in six literal days out of nothing but God, Moses had to write very plainly and clearly to prevent him from putting evolutionary notions into it. And that's why Genesis 1 is so emphatic and definite in speaking of six literal days of special creation. Oh, he wasn't accommodating anything. He was trying to help them to understand the truth of special creation, which they could find no place else than in, than in Genesis. And no other religious books or writings or philosophical books talk about special creation at all. It's unique to the Bible. This is the only true account of the beginning of things. Well, this is the drift of early men. But now, there was no excuse for that. As it says in verse 20, the invisible things of him are clearly seen from the creation. Well, how can invisible things be seen, clearly seen? It says they are understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. You know what that the phrase, the things that are made, is? Maybe you've heard this. It's the word from which we transliterate our English word poem. It was a poetic masterpiece of God's handiwork. It was his design. The, the things that are made, his great poem in creation. Uh, maybe you know that, the, that that word occurs only one other time in the Greek New Testament. There's only one other poetic masterpiece that God has made. Uh, if you don't know where it is, I'll, I'll tell you. It's, it's in Ephesians. The second chapter, it says, By grace you're saved through faith, not, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And the word workmanship is poem. So there are two great poems of God, you see, the work of creation and the work of the new creation, when he takes an old, chaotic, uh, useless life and transforms it into a good work. And he, he, he does a miracle. Well, that's just uh, on the side. Going back to verse 20. <laughs> Note that there are two things, he says here, that are clearly seen in the creation. One is the eternal power of God, and the second is the Godhead of God. One might say the fact of God and the nature of God are revealed clearly in the creation. So that men who don't see them are just inexcusable. It's like Peter says, they're willfully ignorant. There's no excuse for failing to see these great truths of God in his creation. Well, how is this? This is strong language again, obviously. Inexcusable. They ought to see it there. How do men see the eternal power of God in the creation? Now, we've been discussing for uh, several lectures here now the fact that in nature, in the creation, in the natural order of things that God established, there are an infinite number and variety of different kinds of processes. And we divide these up in the different disciplines of science and try to study them and understand them. We have chemistry and physics and so on. And we, the chemist studies chemical processes and the biologist studies biological processes and so forth. And we have all this great variety of, of processes that we study in, the, in nature. But uh, coordinating and framing all of these processes, we have two basic laws which govern all of them. And these we've called the two laws of thermodynamics. They're the first and second laws of science. 
And there isn't any such thing as a process which doesn't obey these two laws, as far as we know scientifically. The first law says that everything is conserved. The second law says everything is running down. The principle of conservation and the principle of decay. Uh, it, although these laws have only been formulated in, a, in scientific terms and mathematical terms for the past hundred years, yet the, the principles that are involved there are simply obvious to experience. We, we know from just plain everyday observation and experience that things wear out and run down and get old and die. This is the second law. But we also know that each kind reproduces its own kind and that uh, when you, change, you can change form, water can turn from, from liquid into ice or into vapor and so on, but it's still water. And so when everything is conserved, we know that from experience. We know that everything runs down from experience. So whether we express these laws mathematically or not, they are so common to everyday experience that everybody just knows them almost intuitively. Now, the early people ought to have known that, but even more so our modern scientists ought to know that because now we have actually measured these and confirmed them scientifically and, and observationally thousands upon thousands of times without ever finding any exception to them. So we know that these two laws are basic laws that control all systems and all processes. Now, another thing that we know is that all processes operate within a dimensional framework of space and mass and time, and we speak of our space, mass, time universe, and this has been formalized also scientifically and mathematically in our physical understanding of what we call our continuum of space and mass and time in the universe. But this also is nothing new. We all, people, the Greeks knew this, and you just know it ex from experience, that everywhere is space and we work through time, and we also know that everywhere in space and time occur things, phenomena, matter, energy. Uh, there's nothing new or, or difficult about this. This is just obvious to experience, so that everybody ought to know these things. But when you stop and think about the significance of these basic facts of experience as well as facts of science, you begin to see that they give a strong witness to certain great truths. And it seems to me that, these ba that the basic laws testify to the eternal power of God and the structure of the cosmos testifies to the nature of God so plainly that people just simply ought to see it, even though it's, they don't. It's sort of like you don't see the forest for the trees. It's, so, you're, it's all around you. And it's so every day that you don't think about it. But there it is. Now, look, uh, just consider then these two laws for a moment. We've talked about them already, but just to review a bit. The first law says that energy is being conserved, and we recognize now that energy is everything, even matter is a form of energy. So that nothing is now being created, but nothing is being annihilated, everything is being conserved. Now, this would tell us then, if we, if we ask the question where it all came from, uh, either of two solutions may be possible. Either there never was a beginning. If everything is now being conserved, energy is conserved, not created or destroyed, then we could say, well, that means that the universe is eternal. Matter always existed. Energy always existed. There never was a beginning. Everything has always been conserved. That's a possibility. The other possibility would be that there was a beginning, but if there was a start of all things, it would have to be in terms of, of mechanisms or processes which don't exist now because... All present processes are conservative and don't create anything, so the universe could never be created by means of the processes which now exist in it. So either there never was a beginning, or if there was, it was by creative processes which stopped and don't exist now. And then the second law says that there must have been a beginning, because otherwise everything would be dead. The second law says that everything is running down and heading towards death, and eventually the whole universe is going to die, a heat death, as they call it, if these present processes continue like they are now for another 20 billion years or so, the universe will just die. Every, all of the suns will die out, the stars, all the highly available energy in the universe will have been degraded down to low level uniform heat energy everywhere, no difference of temperature and no more work can be done. It will still be there, but it will be dead and be useless. And that's going to happen in time if the present processes continue. Now, therefore, you see, in fact, this has been called time's arrow by Sir Arthur Eddington. As time goes on, energy goes down. Therefore, the source of all of this energy must be outside of time, because in time it's going down. And therefore, it isn't temporal power 
It's eternal power. The universe must have had a beginning, otherwise it would be dead. It couldn't have begun itself by the first law. There's no possible conclusion scientifically except that there must have been a great creation in the beginning when the Creator, by creative processes, uh, ordered and organized and created and developed and finished all of these tremendous reservoirs of power and energy in the universe. And since that time he's been conserving them, although also now they're running down because of the curse. The source of all of this power must be outside of time. It isn't temporal power, it must be eternal power. The invisible things of him are clearly seen, even his eternal power. And that's the most scientific conclusion possible from the study of the basic laws of this universe. So no wonder Paul says they're without excuse. Now, not only that, but the Godhead is clearly seen. Now, what is the Godhead? The word itself uh, means, you might say, divinity or godhood. It's used three times in the New Testament, each in a slightly different form, but essentially the same thing. It has to do with the nature of God as he has revealed himself. And, of course, the traditional interpretation, the theologians from the beginning have always understood this to refer to the triune nature of God, the Trinity, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, of course, God has revealed himself in that way, that God is one God, not three gods. You don't have three separate gods involved here, but there's only one God. But that God is triune. He's Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father is the unseen, invisible, omnipresent source of all being and reality. But he is manifest visibly and sensibly in the Son. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So he is the Word of God, the expression of God, the revelation of God. But then God is interpreted and experienced and understood in, in the individual personality by the Holy Spirit, who also is invisible, omnipresent, and nevertheless very personal and real. Now, this we don't understand all about this completely, but it is interesting at least, and I think it's highly significant, that this creation which God created reflects in such a marvelous way the triune structure of the Godhead, because we live in a universe which is a triuniverse. Now, in, in science, as we study these different processes, the way that we try to organize the, the study, the scientific experimentation on a particular process, is to isolate the different factors that to go into it and measure the relations that they have on each other and try to, if we can, express it mathematically, finally. And so we have all these different equations and descriptions of all these different processes, but it's mighty significant that always, if we boil it all down and we get it all correctly worked out, it's eventually ha it's going to have to be expressed in terms of three-dimensional units. Just three, no more. And those three are units of space and mass and time because we're in a space-mass-time universe. Now, that means, you see, well, in engineering, that's my field, we, we, uh, what we, we use the techniques of dimensional analysis and of model analysis. And, of course, every laboratory study is simply a, a model of the physical process that exists in nature. We try to put it down in some kind of a finite scale that we can study and measure. We make a model of the process or of the machine or whatever it is. And then we analyze this model on the basis of its relation to the prototype in terms of the discipline that we call dimensional analysis. And this is, this is completely based on, on the recognition of the fact that every process has to occur in a space-mass-time framework. And so we use dimensions of space in engineering. We use the foot as the unit of length, and we have to use dimensions of time, so we normally use the second as our basic time unit, and then we have to use some kind of a unit of force or matter or energy. These are all sort of interchangeable. Normally in engineering we use the pound, although you could use the dyne or some other force unit or energy unit, and we express our model, work, uh, model results in that framework, and then we project that onto the prototype scale, and we finally, if we get enough information and we get it all boiled down nicely enough, we'll come out with a nice equation describing this process, and we'll say that uh, the, the process is, is measured in terms of foot-pound-second uh, foot units. Or you could use the metric system, use the meter and so on if you want to instead of the foot, but always you have these three basic dimensions. Well, no, that, that, well, this is so obvious that everybody knows it, but I wonder why it's that way. Why should there be just three? Why shouldn't there be two or four or ten? It's always just three. His Godhead is clearly seen. The space-mass-time universe, 
a tri-universe, reflects the nature of its creator. That's why. And if you stop and think about it, each of the three, space and mass and time, is equally the whole. And yet each is separate and distinct and necessary. There's no place in all the universe where there isn't space. Space is everywhere. It's omnipresent. Same way with time. There's no place in the universe that you don't have to work with time. Time is there. Everybody knows what time is, but nobody knows how to define it. It's just always there. You can't define time, but you can't do without it. Uh, it's there everywhere. And everywhere in space and time, in our space-time framework, phenomena are occurring. There isn't any such thing, you see, as empty space. That's a concept we have, but there isn't any such thing as empty space. Everywhere in space exists waves and light and energy and matter and so on. Phenomena are occurring in space through time, and we, we measure the phenomenon or the process or the matter or whatever it is in terms of its movement through space and time, something happening, something moving, even, even static and what looks like dead material, matter, is really not so. It's, it's mostly empty space, tremendous energy in space moving at tremendous velocities, the electron moving around the orbit and the atom and so on, or the waves of the, the quanta of energy moving. In, in wave-like forms and so on. It's a very complex, uh, non-material sort of, of reality which we think we see when we talk about hard matter. But uh, at any rate, everywhere in space and time are occurring these phenomena of matter. So you could say it this way, that the, that the universe uh, is space-mass-time continuum. You can't tell where one stops and another begins because each is the whole. Space is the invisible, omnipresent background of everything, manifesting itself sensibly everywhere uh, in the form of, of matter or energy, but then interpreted and experienced through the, uh, through the medium of time. And all you have to do, you see, is substitute the words Father, Son, and Spirit in that sentence for space and, and matter and time. And you have exactly the same statement. Even his eternal power and Godhead clearly seen in the creation. Now, not only so, but each of these three basic entities is itself a triunity. Stop and think about it. Space is three-dimensional. With each dimension the whole, you can think of space, for example, as being composed of, of an infinite number of lines, all of them going in the same direction. Fill all space with lines having one dimension. Or fill all space with lines going in that direction or that direction. So that each dimension is the whole. And yet you have to have all three to have space. You see, the, the, the mathematics of the Trinity, some people kind of ridicule and say you can't have one plus one plus one equals one. That doesn't make uh, good sense arithmetically, but that's not the mathematics of the Trinity. It's one times one times one equals one. The volume of space is the product of the, <coughs> is the, product of the dimensions. Uh, and and not, only, not only that, but you see, you define space in terms of the first dimension, the foot. Space is defined in terms of the first dimension, but you can't see one dimension. You can draw a line, you say, oh, there's one dimension, but as soon as you can see it, it has two dimensions. It has width as well as length. And so we see space in two dimensions. That's why we have two-dimensional pages in our books and two-dimensional paintings and blueprints and so on. In fact, in engineering, we find it's far easier to teach students to think in terms of two dimensions, to visualize their structures or their processes and so on in two dimensions than in three. It's awful hard to visualize in three dimensions. So we, and that's in our blueprints, we have these orthographic projections. You saw the front view and the top view and the side view and so on in two dimensions. So space is referenced in the first dimension, but it's seen in the second dimension. But then it's experienced in the third dimension. We live in a world of three dimensions. And again, substitute Father, Son, and Spirit in that statement. Same thing. Time, three, three uh, four, the future is, you might say, the unseen reservoir or source of time. Time is flowing, and it's, it sources out in the future somewhere, and then it flows into the present, and it becomes visible and sensible moment by moment in the present, and then passes into the realm of experienced and interpreted time in the past. And then everywhere in space and time occur phenomena. And space, you see, space divided by the time is the velocity or the movement. And we measure the phenomenon in terms of the movement, the motion. Uh, and we define energy like that, you, you recall. Energy, which is the basic 
reality in every phenomenon, even matter, energy we define as the capacity to do work, and we measure the energy in terms of what it does, that is, how it moves. For example, the energy of light is measured in terms of the velocity of light, the motion of light. But then it's experienced in the phenomenon of seeing. Uh, sound, the energy, sound energy, is measured in terms of the movement of sound, the velocity of a sound wave. But then we experience the sound in the hearing, in the phenomenon, and so on. Uh, every, every different type of energy, we could go down the list of all and find the same thing is true, that energy is the unseen source of, of everything that happens in the space-time universe, but it becomes manifest to the senses and the measurements in its movement, but then it's experienced in the particular phenomenon that it produces, whether light or heat or sound or hardness or weight or whatever. So again, the Trinity. Energy is the unseen source, manifest in motion, experienced in phenomena. And so the whole creation, you see, becomes a great trinity of trinities. So that the, the, the basic framework within which all processes operate just clearly cries out the reality of triunity. As difficult as this may be to understand how three can be one, yet it's so real that it's just everywhere in our experience. The invisible things of him are clearly seen from the creation of the world, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The other two times where the word Godhead is used in the New Testament, you know, one is in Acts 17 where Paul told the Athenians, the great philosophers of his day, he says, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In other words, he says, now, men want to make a model of God some way. Uh, the, the pagans in Athens made these little wooden and, and uh, stone images, but the philosophers made the model of God in their own minds. They were too intelligent to think that God was in these sticks and stones, but they had a philosophical model of God, and he says, you can't make God in, in any kind of a model graven by art or man's reasoning, man's device. Man can't make a model of God. We ought not to think that the Godhead is something that man can described in his own frame of reference, but God has made a model of the Godhead in the creation. And then there's another place where the word Godhead is used, and that's in Colossians, second chapter, where it says, and by the way, this is the only place in the Bible where the word philosophy occurs, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the visible manifestation of all the reality of the triune God, manifests forth the whole Godhead bodily, and if we want to know what a real model of God is like, we see God in Jesus Christ. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so Christ is manifest in the creation. Another way which is manifest in the creation we find in the 14th chapter of Acts where Paul and Barnabas had healed a crippled man at Lystra, and there the people then wanted to make gods out of them because of their miracle-working ability. And they didn't want that, and they said in verse 15, Sir, why do you do these things? We're also men of like passion as you. And we're trying to preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good, he gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our lives with food and gladness, our hearts with food and gladness. In other words, he's telling them here that, that God is manifest not only in terms of his creative power in the creation, but also in terms of his, his providing grace. He, he's done good, and he's continually provided the needs that we have for life and food and all things. He giveth all life and breath and all things. And so we ought to be thankful, he says concerning God's gracious gifts as well as his creative power manifest in the creation. He's not left himself without witness. His witness is there. In other words, not only the power of God, but also the grace of God is manifest in the creation. Now, how's this? Especially in contrast with the statement back in Genesis 3, In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Here he says, He's filled our hearts with food and gladness, giving us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. 
Well, there's a basic backdrop, you see, in all of human experience of suffering and sorrow and toil and sweat and tears and death. But superimposed on that, there are continual evidences of God's grace and provision and manifestation of love and favor. And we have this twofold witness continually that there's something wrong, and yet there's also grace. So that every, every day man goes through this, this same experience. The night comes, and the light goes away, and if the light would, were to stay away, why, well, he would soon die because he has to have the light to keep going. But uh, he knows that it's just going to be a time of rest during the night, and then the sun's going to rise again with healing in its rays, and life is going to be restored. And every year he goes through the same thing because the world goes off into a, a winter of cold and the vegetation dies and it looks like the whole world is about to die out. But then man knows that the spring's going to come, the time of the singing of birds, as the Song of Solomon says, is going to come. And the earth is going to give forth its fruit again. And he's going to be able to continue to, to live. And so there's a continual testimony of life out of death and of light out of darkness, just over and over again, so that man knows that somehow, and he can't do this, you see, there's nothing that man can do to be sure that the sun's going to rise the next day or that the spring's going to come the next year. He can't control this. It's just by the grace of God that this is provided for him. And so continually there, there's a witness to him that even against the background of suffering and death, God is continually providing for his needs. And it ought to, as Paul says, cause him to be thankful. But instead of being thankful, he doesn't want to do worship him as God and made them images and so on, but he con continues giving us rain and fruitful seasons. And all of this continually testifies that someday, you see, man just knows intuitively, even though it's easier to do wrong, he knows that he ought to do right. And although it's, it's easier to let yourself go and, and, to, and to let death come, just if you just do nothing, don't take food into your body or anything, well, you'll die. It's easier just to sit and do nothing. But uh, nevertheless, uh, there is always the provision and the testimony that, that uh, God has our, our interests and our concerns at his heart, and someday he's going to do something about restoring all things. And this promise has come down from the beginning. Uh, he's going to bruise the head of, this, uh, of the, the heel of the seed of the woman, God told the serpent. But he says he's someday going to crush your head. And God's going to perfect that which concerns him. He's going to restore all things. And this testimony is continually there every day, day after day, and every year, year after year, that, that's there. And then especially is that testimony present in, in, the, in the very fact of physical life, of biological life. Man is heading towards physical death as well as spiritual death, but uh, nevertheless there is a continual renewal of life every spring and every day and every generation. Death comes to each individual, but life comes again, and so there's the miracle of birth every, every generation in the whole animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the human kingdom, and it's, this is all just a testimony of the fact that God has promised someday that through this miracle of birth, the seed of the woman is going to come and destroy the serpent. And every time a birth takes place, why, this is just a further testimony to the fact that life is going to someday come out of death. And even every, every time a life is born, it's out of, the, out of the experience of suffering and travail and often of death. Uh, look quickly back at the 22nd Psalm. You know, this is the great psalm of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, written a thousand years before it was fulfilled, and it describes in great detail the sufferings of Christ on the cross. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He cries out. But then down in verse 6, I don't have time to go through all the verses of this psalm, but it's a tremendous study. He says, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Now, what did he mean by saying I'm a worm? You ever thought of that? Maybe you know this, but if you don't, this is a thrill to me. This particular worm is different from other kinds of worms. There are different kinds of worms, of course. There are different varieties of worms, and this is a particular worm. Now, it, doesn't, it, it means more than just that he isn't a man. Of course, Isaiah 52 says that I, his visage was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. He was literally made corruption, personified. He didn't even look like a man there on the cross. But he's talking about more than that here. He said, I'm a worm and no man. Well, this is a scarlet worm. There are different kinds of worms, but this worm is a scarlet worm, and 
And the reason it was called that, because it had the ability to secrete a scarlet fluid, which was used in making the scarlet dyes that they used in ancient days. And a matter of fact, when you find the word scarlet in the Bible, it's the same word. Though your sins be as scarlet. It's the same word exactly as worm here. The, the worm was identified with the crimson color and the, the life cycle of that worm, something like this. When the mother worm was ready to give birth to the baby worms, why, she would find a, a trunk of a tree or a post or a stick somewhere, and then she would plant her body in that wood, and she would implant her body so firmly in it that she could never leave it anymore, and then the young would be brought forth, and her mother's, the mother's body would provide protection for the, for the babies as long as they needed before they could get out and take care of themselves, and then the mother would die. And in the process, the scarlet fluid would stain her body and the body of the young and the tree and so on. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm like that scarlet worm. But he's making peace through the blood of his cross. He's bringing many sons into glory through the suffering. And this is a testimony, you see, a graphic testimony of the fact that eternal life comes out of the suffering and death of the Son of God. And you find this in every... In every birth, there's always the possibility of death. There's always travail. Jesus said in John 16, says, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But when she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And so although there's always suffering and travail and death in order for life to come, yet it's always a time of joy and rejoicing when the life does come. And this just continually testifies, you see, that someday... The seed of the woman is going to come, and all there is going to be a time of suffering and death. He's going to bring forth a seed, and he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. And that seed shall serve him. And uh, eventually, why, there will be no more death and no more sorrow and no more crying and no more travail. The whole creation is going to be delivered. A new birth is going to take place, but to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just one another point here in closing. Here in this 22nd Psalm, you know, the book of Psalms is a book of praises of Israel, the Halal book. And you, you find the, ver the, the word praise over and over again in the, in the book of Psalms. And I don't know if you ever thought of this or not. It may not appeal to anybody but me because I'm interested in numbers and all like that because I guess engineering and, and everything. But uh, there, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph and so forth, and this is the alphabet, and this is the language through which God chose to deliver his written word to man. And the very purpose, you see, of communication and of language is in order that man might receive the word of God, and that he in turn might respond in praise and thanksgiving to God. Now, the book of Psalms is the book of praises, but you don't find the verb halal, to praise, anywhere in the first 21 Psalms. First time you find it is in Psalm 22. Now, I know that the chapters and verse divisions and so forth were not in the original inspired word, except in the book of Psalms they were, because these chapters were there from the beginning, and so were the verses, because the Psalms are poetry, and so the chapter and verse divisions are part of the original structure of the book of Psalms. And I just think it's significant that the first time the word praise occurs in the book of Psalms is in Psalm 22, verse 22 where the Lord Jesus, right after the awful climax of his sufferings on the cross, then responds after God hears him and, and answers his prayer, and he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And that's the first time the verb praise occurs, Psalm 22 and 22. And it's the Lord Jesus who's giving the praise, and he's going to do it in the midst of the congregation. And this verse is quoted in Hebrews. He says, In the midst of the church will I praise thee. Where, I'm, where, where they're gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And so, you see, whenever we gather together in the church in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's there in our midst, and he's the one who is leading our praises to God in the midst of the congregation. Well, I praise thee. And he, he gives that word of praise right after the climax of the awful sufferings when he gave his life and he suffered hell itself in order to give us eternal life. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. 
Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.